I'm Harvey Sinton, a humble researcher working for the International Secret Service. I was delighted to find out that I was leading the ISS newest project, and testing is taking place primarily underground next week in the Human Experiment Chamber, SF-23. Its aim is to develop an innovative and shocking method of torture, which is designed to discourage potential ISS members from betraying the organization, and as a punishment for captured hitmen from overseas. Ones that are discovered to be targeting ISS leaders. Over the course of the project, I will document every detail in this written report along with a video to accompany the results of each experiment. After the project is formally ended, I will suggest the best conclusion to the testing based on the evidence collected. Once again, I thank my superiors for allowing me to pioneer this project, which will undoubtedly benefit the ISS community for as long as it exists. H.J. Sinton, Human Biologist, Qualified Researcher, SG-64 That's the opening statement for my report. Now, I don't blame you for thinking I'm some kind of insane genius. I'm not that kind of Frankenstein that you see on television, in fact. I'll admit I'm a pretty emotionally unstable guy. I've been hiding myself behind a facade since I joined the service. I'm working for the ISS, a criminal organization, and I've been working there for a long time now. Headquarters is situated underground on the coastline of Concaven Island. It's like the Mafia, it's just less well known. And it's brought me to a handful of problems as a US citizen, not to mention some emotional trauma too, but I couldn't resist the temptation. Yeah, I'd have a good pay for the rest of my life. At the end of two years of service, I signed the unbreakable contract. After a further two years in the job, I began to believe that anyone, whether they start meek or macho, could condition themselves into a state of mind where they felt almost no empathy for anyone else. The human brain needs conditioning to keep its empathy sensors refreshed, so the more you don't use it, the less you'll be inclined to feel sorry for random people, right? And then I realized it wasn't that simple, and sadly, I realized too late. Take my word for it. If you're a normal, sane human being, don't ever try to fit in with psychos. It's because there's no difference between the fakers and the real deal. And what I'm trying to say is, you'll never know what's inside the mind of a psychopath if you weren't born one yourself. Anyone that tries to believe otherwise will ultimately drive themselves insane. 9 a.m. It was time to meet the unfortunate victims. There were 13 inmates who had arrived from a prison on the island. The purpose of seeing the subjects before beginning the test was for estimating measurements. But it was still nice to get to know them before sending them to their deaths in the most painful ways imaginable. And there were two women and 11 men. And as I was scribbling down descriptions on my notepad, one of the big guys tried to attack me. Although he could only go as far as the metal bars of his cell would allow, the sudden outburst still made me jump. I made a mental note to order extra restraints. For this one. I put my clipboard down, then decided to talk to them. Some swore at me in every sentence, but most of them were nicer than I imagined, which was creepy, especially the middle-aged lady who had poisoned her husband and offered me a foot massage. I asked them what crimes they had committed, and whether they were scared at all. Some notable answers included things to do with animals, things to do with my mom, the sight of a teenager in one of the cells caught my interest. I'd never seen such a young inmate arrive here for testing before, and I wondered what crime he had committed. I asked him if he was afraid of his approaching fate. He answered, Less scared than you are. I'm sad to say that he was probably telling the truth. A thin, wide smile spread across his face when he saw my expression change. Not sure why, but I suddenly felt slightly nauseous. I convinced myself that he was bluffing, and I walked away quickly. The young blonde lady refused to talk to me at all. She sat in the corner of that last cell, sobbing continuously. I guessed that she was in her mid-twenties. I asked her why she was crying. 
She tried her best to convince me that she'd been falsely accused of murdering her sister. Yeah, they don't lie, and they tell me the most innocent looking ones are always, always the most cunning. 1 p.m. I decided to skip lunch for reasons that I'm sure you'll understand. My heart was beating fast, but I did my best to hide my anxiety. Then called in the first test subject. I asked my scientists to set up the cameras and other monitors while I prepared the instruments of death. Originally, I had no idea what to name it, but my little bald scientist suggested angel wings. You described it well. I chose the macho-looking guy who tried to attack me to go first. When he walked in, I expected at least a swagger or a glare, but none of that. I could see it in his eyes. The guy was more terrified than he'd ever been in his life. Security strapped him into the long, box-shaped metal frame. He was encased in what looked like a hollow cage without the extra bars in the middle, and two flat iron bars met in the center of his body. Attached to his underside were many small, sharp iron spikes suspended above his chest. A guard nodded at me without warning. And I pressed the button, which suddenly lowered the two iron bars plunging the spikes into the middle of his chest and abdomen. He screamed and clenched his fist as blood began oozing out and then turned his head to look at me. I raised my eyebrows. I'll only start when you're ready. Remember, the longer you wait, the more it'll hurt. I reminded him. He breathed heavily, then turned his head back around to look at his bleeding body. Then he winced and looked away. What are you gonna do to me? He said. The bars? I pointed. They're gonna move in opposite directions until you split open. He took a moment to digest the thought. Can you hold my hand? He pleaded like a child. I hadn't expected to hear that from a big guy like himself. I was almost amused. No, I answered straightforwardly. Are you afraid that I'll break your bones? Can I start now? And don't tell my family how I died. I don't want them to know what happened to me. We're not going to tell your family anything. Cheers. He wheezed quietly and then closed his eyes. Fuck this stupid ass world, just do it. The scientists sat opposite me, holding their pens ready above their notepads, observing, eyes wide open like hungry wolves staring at prey. Suddenly, I pressed the start button on the timer and flicked the switch, which started his ordeal, preparing myself for the screams. The two metal bars began to pull his skin apart, incredibly slowly. He grimaced with his eyes closed for ten seconds and held it in for as long as he could, but when the green line of the pain monitor leapt up, his eyelids burst open and he let out a blood-curdling shriek. Around the three-minute mark, his organs started to be exposed. I had to pause the machine temporarily since he was close to passing out. I restarted it after two minutes. He was too tired to scream. By the end of ten minutes, where all his organs were completely exposed, but it wasn't until they started to slide out of him when I started to cringe. I reminded myself that he was still alive and conscious while this was all happening. Suddenly, I had an inexplicable urge to vomit. I, I knew I needed to keep focus and watch the graphs in case he died, but my mind drifted elsewhere. Though he was just a criminal, he had a family and people that probably cared about him. But if they knew that I was the one doing this to him. I had a family too, and admittedly, I hadn't told them the entire truth about my profession. What would they think? He was dying from something I'd created. I never thought about it in that way before. And to be quite honest, it 
It hurt me inside when I did. I told myself that his family weren't here. They'd never know of this, never know that I did it. They probably didn't like him that much anyway. It doesn't fucking matter. Just do your job. I walked to the other side where neither the scientist nor the camera could see, pretending to analyze the breathing graph in more detail. Then I gripped his hand, slippery from blood dripping down it. He turned his head towards me, and for a second I thought I could see some sort of surprise in his eyes. I prayed that he, he wouldn't spend his last seconds alive cursing me. Then his skin ripped from his sides and dangled from the iron nails. He continued to breathe, heavily, for a few moments before he died. And the machine made a high-pitched beeping noise. Swallowing, I let go of his hand. And waited as his organs sloshed out of him one by one. And onto the floor. The timer said 15 minutes, 35 seconds. One of the scientists stopped the camera. 15 minutes, 35 seconds. How was it? I asked. She looked down at her clipboard. The skin stayed intact, which was good. As it was on the top of the priority list for this device, it moved outward at a steady rate, too. However, continued the bald scientist, the time he was alive fell short of the predicted time by a half a minute. Also, if you were to redesign the model, we suggest some sort of appliance to keep the organs inside the body. That might improve the time. The voices were calm and steady as they talked. I looked into their eyes. Cold, robotic, unblinking. I wondered if they'd ever been sympathetic to anyone in their whole lives. I wondered if they were wearing masks like me. Right. I was thinking that too. I'll take it into account in the report. Two days later, 4 p.m. My boss, Allman, grinned the whole time as he watched the video, occasionally making unsympathetic noises such as oof and ouch. These people weren't human. Either that or I was a lot less tough than I first thought I was. It was time for the second torture instrument. This one was less unique than the first one in the sense that similar things have been tried before, but it was the boss's idea, not mine. Apparently, it was also the one which kept the victim alive and suffered for the longest time. I called for security to bring me a random test subject. She was dragged into the room, screaming and begging. She was the young lady with the blonde hair. She shouted that she didn't do it. And that she was innocent. But I was taking none of it. I signaled at security to strap her into the confines. I had a feeling she wasn't going to tell me when to kill her. So I didn't bother to warn her. Slowly, I took out a syringe and a small jar full of bluish-yellow liquid. I closed the box, then unscrewed the jar lid sucking out a syringe of its contents. No. No, please don't do this to me. I walked closer, holding my poker face, showing her I was uninterested. She continued to sob and pant. It w I wasn't the one, she whispered. As she shook her head frantically, I know who killed her. It wasn't me. Don't do this. I positioned the syringe above her collarbone and plunged it into her neck. She moved too much, so I had to steady the needle to avoid it snapping. As the fluid entered her skin, her neck started to turn slightly blue and her veins swelled as she gasped in agony. And then I ran over to the laptop and started the timer. According to the measurements, she should be dead in around three days. Strap her head to the wall, I told the lady scientist. When her neck turns white, you can leave. I'm off to take a bite. Harvey Stinton! She shrieked at her ear-piercing pitch. Just as I was about to walk out of the door, I turned around, my eyes wide open. I hated it when they called my name. 
You're a young and smart person. You've got a lot left to live for. Why did you become a murderer? Murderer. I wasn't a murderer. It was my job to kill murderers. And that doesn't count as murder, does it? Who are you to judge? Something clicked inside me and I suddenly felt feverish like my brain was overheated. I would ask you the exact same, forgetting momentarily that she wasn't a guy. <laughs> I really didn't. You have to believe me. I finally went to get my lunch. Man, it had been a rough day. As I changed my clothes and came out from underground after two hours of security checks, a thought crossed my mind. How was I so sure that she was guilty of the murder? Was it faith in the justice system? I mean, most likely. Of course, it, it didn't matter whether she was or not. She was already going to die. But it felt like I needed some sort of proof or I'd be uncomfortable living with the possibility that I'd killed an innocent for the rest of my life. 7 p.m. Just one more hour of goddamn report writing and I could go home. My eyes were starting to see double. But then there was the security checks again. I had to keep my profile real low working for ISS, and that meant suffering another two hours of fatigue. An alarm sounded, and I got out of my cubicle to take a look at what was happening. Secret agents were scurrying around like black mice, mainly towards that left corridor where I followed them. It just happened that Allman was looking for me. He led me to the cells in which the test subjects were kept, and I saw them all strapped extremely tightly to the wall, much like the lady in the experiment chamber. Two of the cells, which I realized belonged to the middle-aged woman and the bald guy, were empty. I asked my boss what was happening. He explained that one of the guys monitoring the CCTV footage wasn't paying attention, which allowed the two removed subjects to commit suicide by banging their heads on the walls repeatedly. One day later, 4 p.m. I checked the lady still strapped to the chamber before I began testing on the next victim. Unsurprisingly, she had stopped resisting and her body hung almost lifeless. Her whole body had turned white, except for her face, which had a bit of a blue tinge. Sweat still dripped from her forehead, so I gave her some water and examined the graphs. Comparing them to the ones produced by the first test subject, pain receptors detected slightly lower levels of trauma than the first, but it had a tendency to increase as the victim approached death. Security produced a crooked old guy with the more... with the most circular spine I'd ever seen. They looked at me as if asking whether this guy was suitable or not. He'll do. Strap him in. I fastened my goggles, then put my gloves and protective clothing on. He made no noise. He just looked around. I was hoping that I had started to get accustomed to the project, since this was my third test already. But as I imagined him crying out in pain, I felt that inevitable sense of dread return. It was annoying me now. He sat down on a metal chair with a circular base. Unlike the others, his eyes told me nothing. He just seemed like a man tired of being alive. The chair was nailed tightly to the wall behind it and clamped to the ground for extra security. His limbs were locked in place, his arms were spread in a T-shape across the wall, and his legs were fastened to the legs of the chair. Then his head was strapped into a solid square-shaped device with an iron frame. And the scientist used the two tiny metal clamps to clamp his eyelids wide open. Using more clamps, the device positioned a curved block of solid green acid just a millimeter or so in front of his open eye. A large glass box was placed over his head. When you're ready. There was no hesitation at all. Aye. I pulled the lever, and the device moved that block of acid so that it was pressed against his eyes. He screamed, and I quickly flicked the switch above my head, which first sealed the glass box so that it became airtight. 
then activated a heater which produced a temperature of around 50 degrees Celsius. As the acid melted, it burned his eyes and skin. The green line shut up instantly, and the device rattled as he tried to move. An hour later, there was nothing left except for patches of black, red, and green. His face was pink, and the skin of his cheeks and forehead was burnt raw and purple. He groaned constantly. I couldn't resist closing my eyes for a while because I, I didn't want to look anymore. There were cameras and observers everywhere doing it for me, so I didn't have, I didn't have to. And I'm surely I could give myself a little comfort by saying that he deserved what he got. I took a deep breath, then opened my eyes again and turned to my scientists. It ends here when the acid melts completely. One hour, three minutes. I pressed the last button and a blade sliced his head off clean. I sat at my desk typing away. Abruptly, I spun around in my chair. There was nothing behind me, so I shut the door and continued writing the report. I had planned to upload the video along with it, as I usually did, however, I seemed to have misplaced my laptop. And that was a problem because I transferred the video files onto there, from the camera. The lights flickered. And I heard more... bumping and knocking noises. But I wasn't sure where they were coming from. Just as I was about to get up and investigate, the phone rang, and I sat back down to pick it up. Harvey Stenton from room SG-64, who's speaking? Yeah, this is Allman. Hey boss, how can I help? I'd like you to show what you've done so far regarding your report to our newest contract killer. Treat this also as a part of the ISS contract testing. I zoned out and stopped listening to his words. Someone or something was slowly shifting into view of the cubicle window. Someone with a face whiter than paper, someone blonde. Clutching her neck, she limped closer and closer to the small glass viewing pane in front of me. I panicked as a million questions raced through my mind. How did she get out? How could she have moved all the way across the corridor without being seen? What the hell should I do now? She turned her head and blood dripped from her mouth and nose down into her white prison uniform. And the side of her lips curved upwards into a smile. I nearly shit my pants. There was only a thin sheet of glass separating her from me. Sinton? You still there? Sinton? The voice came from the telephone, which I had dropped at my feet. I, I, I've come to warn you, she sputtered. They told me. They told. They said you'll. They'll get you and. And everyone you love. What? Who who are you talking about? You have You have a brother called Joey. He lives with your parents on the on the coast. Do you know where they are? How the hell did you know that? She was bringing up family members I hadn't seen in ages since I started working for the ISS. They took your laptop. They, they know everything about you. You can't hide from them anymore. Who is they? You'll see. A bead of sweat trickled down the side of my face. The problem was... It wasn't my laptop. It was the ISS on which they stored the databases of their employees. Furthermore, if they knew things like my brother's name, they must have been able to access it with the password. My mind was in a chaotic state, but I only worried truly about one thing. Whoever they were, they had access to information about me, which they weren't supposed to know. My address. The address of my family members. I... I flicked the emergency switch and bolted the fuck out of there. Two seconds later, security guards grabbed the lady and dragged her back to her cell, followed by the trail of blood. I wondered what on earth had gone wrong. Then after I entered the imprisonment chamber with the security guards, I immediately knew who they were. 
two of the doors of the cell were left wide open and I couldn't believe it. Who is in charge of the security cameras here? The inmates stared at us, heads strapped to the walls, smiling unnervingly. The lady scientist ran into the chamber. I, I believe it was the man wearing the trench coat. He told me he wanted to have a word with you. I'm not going to bloody talk to him. I Just tell him he's fired from my department for neglect and misconduct right now. She ran out without a word. And so did I. Back to the hallway into my office cubicle before my boss could catch me. I secured all the locks and the doors, took out my personal cell phone, dialed my brother's number. He asked about this mess. And I'd have to cover it up somehow. But first, I had to warn him that his life was in danger. He didn't pick up the first time, so I tried again. I was relieved for a second when he did. Until I heard the voice on the other end speak. Hey, bro. How you doing? It was cold. And brittle, nothing like Joey's voice. Who are you? You know who I am, Harvey. You wouldn't forget your own brother, would you? Cut it out, okay? Tell me what you've done to him. If you really want to know, you'll have to be patient. How did you get past security? I said, you'll have to wait. The line cut off, and I studied my breathing as best as I could, but I still wasn't able to stop myself from shaking. Should I call the police? No. No, there's nothing they could be able to do. My phone vibrated and an email popped up. It had no subject. The only words in the email was, enjoy. Great. I found out my mail address, too. And what the hell were these attachments? The thumbnails were blurry, so I couldn't tell what it was exactly. I uploaded the videos onto the computer and clicked on the first one, which was named Man 1. After a brief second of static, the picture came into view. The video quality was bad, but I could make out that it was some sort of warehouse. Three figures sat in clear view next to each other, each tied to a chair by their arms and legs. From left to right, I recognized them as my dad, mom, and brother, Joey. They were unconscious. Their heads drooped to the side, panic came over me, and I choked on my saliva, sputtering as I continued to watch. My family was in danger, and it was all because of me. Someone began to talk, but I couldn't hear his voice over the sound of the alarm and the chaotic yelling in the background. I turned the volume up, and I rewound. Hello, Sinton. It was the same creepy voice that I heard on the other side of the line just now. A man walked into view, though I could only see him from the waist down. He was wearing black jeans and sneakers. Another one followed him, wearing the prison uniform trousers, and was barefoot. The guy in sneakers was on the left. He poured water on my parents and Joey. They began to regain consciousness slowly. They all went into a state of shock. The fuck is this? I heard Joey yell. Who the- Another voice silenced him. It belonged to the teenager. This is for the big guy. He pointed at my dad, who looked around terrified. Wait, take the phone. Go to the other side, instructed the other guy. The camera moved up and closer to my dad as the teenager flipped the chair, so my dad was lying on the floor on the chair back. When they both took out knives, I realized what was about to happen. No, 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 you've got to be kidding me, I whispered. They were screaming and shouting in the background. They stabbed my dad just below his neck and pulled down sharply, splitting his abdomen, and then they used the knives to cut him open, exposing his organs. I couldn't watch, so I looked away, and when I looked back, my dad stopped yelling in pain, and his head dropped. No! Fuck! I screamed. As tears rolled down my face, my nails had punctured the skin of my palms, and there was blood on my sleeves. The video was cut off, and the window closed. I still couldn't stop shaking and breathing. I clicked on the second video named Woman 2, and braced myself for the worst. But I wasn't ready for what I would see next. The footage was shaky because the teenager was holding the camera. The other guy was in the scene, and he put a hand over my mom's mouth to stop her from screaming. Joey yelled at him to let go of my mom, but his anguished cries were left unheard. This is for the blonde chick, he said. He held a glass bottle full of some strange red liquid, which fizzed about. 
I screamed when I realized what he was about to do next. He unwrapped a syringe that he took from the cardboard box on the floor and extracted some liquid in it. He proceeded to inject it into her neck. Then he chucked it over his shoulder. The chair rocked back and forth as my mom yelled in pain and her legs kicked into the air. Minutes later, blood squirted out of her eyes and her skin turned blue as she suffocated to death. I closed it down. Sobbing uncontrollably, I felt blood slowly down my arms as I clicked on the next video. Man 3. They switched roles again. Now the teenager was in the scene and the camera focused on Joey. Dude, bring it closer, he said to the other guy. When he did, I was about to see the stains of tears on Joey's face. This is for the hunchback. His voice was almost happy. He took the bottle of red liquid from the previous clips and unscrewed the cap, laughing. Joey cried and yelled at him to stop, but both guys started laughing wildly. As he put on some plastic gloves and pinched Joey's face, he poured the liquid into it. Burning at pink and black, Joey's screams were muffled out by the sounds of gargling and choking. Then I vomited. I skipped the last 10 seconds or so so I could... I have not. I couldn't bear to watch. Both guys are in view now, the teenager holding the camera like he was taking a selfie. You know what this is? The other guy asked me directly as he pulled out that laptop from the inside of the cardboard box. We saw the videos you made, so we decided to make our own as well. We thought it was rather fucking mean. So we decided to give you a taste of your own medicine. You can't get us. And we'll see you soon. Harvey Sinton. We're coming for you. The two murderers laughed madly. The video turned black and the browser closed for the last time. They split my dad open like I split open the first man. They injected my mom with poison like I had injected poison into the blonde lady. They burned the face of my brother like I'd burned the face off the old man. They made me pay. That was it. They prayed the videos were fake or something, but who was I kidding? I sent my own family to their deaths. They'd never even been told what was happening. Essentially, I'd killed them. Now karma sealed my fate and I was next. I understood real pain. For the first time in my life, I asked myself, why did I not have the dignity to treat each human being as a life? Why the fuck did I allow myself to take up a job which would cause not just pain and suffering for the victims, but endless grief for their families as well? Ultimately, I dragged myself into a position so low, even criminals would mock my name. Anyone working for ISIS? Oh, wow, ISIS, yeah. Anyone working for the ISS was a cursed madman. I wasn't a psychopath. I didn't want to be a psychopath. I was... I was going to stop pretending to be one too. Someone was knocking on the door, but I ignored it. I wondered why. When I held the bloody hand of the dying man, did I not clench my fist till my nails made my hands bleed? Why, when I injected the poison into the veins of the lady, did I not cry and yell for her pain to stop? Why, when I, when I scorched the face off that old crook, did I not vomit in disgust? I knew what I had to do. I unlocked the door and I raced past the man waiting for me outside. The boss's office was the building below, and I was sure that he was at the scene of the discovered breakout. I took the lift down and went into the room searching for his gun. Grabbing it from the top shelf, I took the lift back up and bolted through the empty hallway. Employees and contract killers alike had gathered around the imprisonment chamber, and an irate red-faced almond cursing, trying to figure out what the hell had happened. The inmates knew everything. They laughed and spat at him. I pushed past them with all of my strength until I found myself standing at the back of the experiment chamber where only the blonde lady was still restrained. I locked the door behind me, blocking out most of the noise. She was still strapped tightly against the wall. Her face was deathly pale. Her body convulsed violently. Losing what little strength she had left, she turned to look at me. I walked closer to her than I aimed that gun at her head. I believe you, I said. 
Telling the truth or not, I still believe you because you're, you're right. I am a murderer. Her face lit up. Then I pulled the trigger, putting her out of her misery. I sat down. And I cried for a long time. I cried because I realized the barbaric shame I had brought upon humanity and how I'd failed to see it until it was too late. If I were the Harvey sent and everyone thought I was, I... I wouldn't be here crying like a baby. I'd be denying that, that I ever did anything wrong. Carrying on my life feeling no shame or remorse, but I'm not a psychopath. And I think that somewhere in the back of my mind I always knew I'd never live up to my name and I, I lived in fear of the day that I would acknowledge it. My story ends here. I hope you enjoyed it because you're not going to hear it from me again. I'm not proud of a single thing I've done in my entire life except for what I'm about to do right now because if I've learned one thing, one thing from all of this, it's that I should never have been born. Someone's telling me to open the door. I have a gun pointed at my head, but I'm hesitant because I'm afraid. <laughs> Wait a minute. Henry Jack Sinton, afraid. What irony. No doubt the people I butchered were afraid. But it's not like they had any choice. I'm the one giving myself the easy way out. It's time to fix that mistake named the existence of Harvey Sinton. It's time to end it here. The lady scientist sauntered into the research hall. She had a proud grin on her face as she looked around. A, a while later, everyone stopped talking and staring at her, wondering what the hell she was doing. And at last, she spoke. Guess who Almond's new head researcher is? Everyone clapped with congratulations. She walked over to her new assistant, the little bald scientist who patted her on the back. Uh, you won't go nuts and shoot yourself like Sinton did, right? Of course not. I'm a professional. She took care to emphasize the word. I remember you said something like that as well. No, oh, never mind. Uh, when are you going to restart the testing? Her grin widened, spreading from ear to ear. Uh, yes, I've got everything planned. We're starting right now. I modified Sinton's remaining prototypes with my little touch. So they're going to produce the best results possible. What? Right now, we haven't even prepared the experiment chamber. What the hell are you standing around for? She snapped. And while you're at it, tell Almond that we need two more subjects to replace the ones that have got away. Yeah, whatever you say. Where's this laptop? The one that contains the videos? She couldn't find it anywhere in his room. But it would probably reappear later. She walked into the empty chamber and stood still momentarily to calm herself. She had never been more pleased in her life. This was where that she would continue his work and she couldn't wait any longer to start. She sat at the desk and began to think about his suicide, which had occurred to her as strange. Sinton's prototypes and reports were both excellent, admittedly better than anything she had ever produced. He was the perfect man for the job. It was the perfect job for him. Why a man in such great positions would want to kill himself was beyond her understanding, and she would never understand. Because she was pure evil. And she was born that way. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story. And thank you all for listening. Please help support the channel at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta and make sure to tune in for new horror stories every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday night. Many of the horror authors that I've worked with throughout this channel have all come together to work on one big book series, The Creepypasta Collections Volume 1 and 2. Check them out on Amazon or at any local bookstore near you. Thanks for listening, kids, and sweet dreams. <laughs>